I call that picking your battles. So <laughs> you right. know, I, when I'm, when I, and honestly, when I'm ministering or, or, or witnessing to uh, couples or, you know, married women or whatever, I said, baby, you got to pick your battles. Right. It's not as important as you think it is. You know, you, some things just let it go. Just let it go. And so uh, there is a teacher over Brandy uh, for your daughter if she wants to go. She doesn't have to, but if she wants to, her teacher is here. Uh, so uh, we thank God for being here this morning. Thank God for each one of you. Thank you, Pastor Bland. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open up your Bibles, please, to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. And let's go to uh, chapter 20, Jeremiah chapter 20. So we um, uh, just, um, Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah chapter 20. We're just picking up where we left off last Sunday as we uh, begin to talk about how it is a universal feeling to become discouraged. You know, everyone, you're not gonna be up on the mountain not all the time, not 24 seven, not, you're just not going to be up on the mountaintop. Uh, and I tell you, sometimes it just seems like discouragement comes uh, out of nowhere. Sometimes you can be doing fine and you just everything, like my old pastor say, you're walking along it's like you got the world in the bottle and a stopple in your hand. It's just kicking rocks and whistling. And all of a sudden, uh, just a cloud of discouragement will come. Well, that's the devil's job. That's the devil's job to discourage you. And many times what will happen is the situations you're in and the people you are around, uh, the things you're going through will have an effect on you. And if somebody tells you that as a believer, as a Christian, you shouldn't be like that, you just tell them, I'm in this world. And as long as you're in this world, you're going to have some stuff that comes up that discourages you. It will discourage you. And so now it doesn't mean you have to stay there, but it, it does. it's going to come. And we need to walk in that reality that that will happen. What happens is you become more discouraged when you try not to be discouraged because somebody said you shouldn't be. And so we want to live in uh, reality. And so Jeremiah was just like us. Uh, all, the only thing that Jeremiah had a calling on his life to be a prophet, and as a prophet, he was called to speak the word. And God told him when he called him, uh, I'm calling you, but the people will not hear you. They're not going to hear you. And so uh, your job is going to be difficult. So one thing we have to realize is that when we're called, when we are a servant, it doesn't mean that everything's going to go uh, just smoothly for us. There's going to be some rough places. There's going to be some uh, uh, rocky places, some obstacles. There's going to be some things that we have to overcome when we serve. And so uh, Jeremiah became discouraged. And as we look at chapter 20 and we go to verse 7, verse 7 says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hath prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. Jeremiah said, not a day go by that nothing going on in my life. And look like I ought to have some kind of relief sometimes, but be because of the calling that you placed on my life, I'm going through. I'm going through. Oh, I can I can identify with him and many times. You know, you're going through for this or you're going through for that. But he said, because of what you told me to do, I'm going through. He says, you've overpowered me. It's like you subdued me because you're stronger than me. And I just allowed you to do it. So Jeremiah felt like he had been kind of cheated there. But see, the thing about it, Jeremiah, all he had to do was go back in his mind, Brandy, because God told him when he called him that he wasn't going to be heard. So it shouldn't have been a surprise to him. But in his humanness, he became 
uh, uh, just uh, in despair. He became despaired. And so, uh, as we said last Sunday, this is, according to history, the last recorded lament. And a lament is when you're moaning and groaning about things. This is the last recorded one. And as I said, it is a blending of grief. It's a blending of joy. It's a blending of prayer and despair, praise, and perplexity. And so, as we uh, began to talk, um, Pastor Blaine, you have something? I was just thinking, you know, you were talking about Jeremiah should have been ready, but you know, you can know something is coming, but when that pain comes, sure, you know, exactly. it's like even when you're getting ready to get a shot or get ready to whatever, you know, it's getting ready to do it, but when the pain hit, you just holler out anyway. And even Christ, he knew, but then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when it really came. Exactly, exactly. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Pastor Bland. And so um, when we had our uh, group discussion, the thought was that as we serve the Lord, our capacity for ministry should increase and enable us to do much more than we ever thought we could do. I will say that, uh, that you, you are stretched beyond uh, imagination of the things that you can do. And that's just evident by Jeremiah. Jeremiah went through much more, more than he thought he could. And we can go through much more than we think we can. Have you ever said, Lord, I just can't take any more? Yeah. Have you ever said that? But then some more come. Are you still here? You can take much more than you think you can. You can. You're built that way. God built you that way. And so uh, it is, um, uh, it's kind of like a paradox, though, because we have to realize that we have to still lean and depend on God. Lean and depend on God, but now you're not built to fall out at everything that comes. You know, and so if you lean and depend on God, that gives you the strength to keep walking. Gives you the strength to keep going. And so uh, Jeremiah said here, for since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. I wanted to stop. I wanted to quit. And so Jeremiah resolved that he was going to quit. So I'm not going to even mention his name anymore. And so he decided to keep his mouth shut and not even mention the Lord, but we know that that just didn't work. When the Lord has placed purpose in your heart, when the Lord has placed a calling on your life, you might want to sit down, you might want to quit, but you cannot because God is pushing you, the spirit of the Lord is pushing you in your back to keep going and working towards your purpose. And so uh, that didn't work for him. And so uh, no matter how much he was constrained to preach God's word, Jeremiah had to deal with the fact that many people wanted to keep him quiet. Many people wanted to keep him quiet, and they would take uh, the necessary steps, whatever it took, to keep him quiet, as was evident with the reason he's like this Pashur. Pashur heard him preaching in the temple and said, no, we got to shut him up. We got to shut him up because this won't work. He's going around and he's uh, uh, just uh, provoking everybody and, and inciting everyone, you know. They, we got these priests over here saying we don't have to do this because we're not going into captivity. And then he's coming saying that we are going into captivity. These prophets saying that we're not going, but here he comes saying that we are going. And so we need to shut him up. And so Jeremiah, as, as evident in this monologue with, uh, or dialogue with the Lord, Jeremiah's mood swings from expressing courage to revenge and then to rejoicing in worship. And then he goes from just like, you know, he says like, Lord, I just hate I was ever born. He says here, uh, look at verse 11. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. 
Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, that tri tri triest the righteous and seeth the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I opened my cause. And then see, he goes into praise, and it's just a mix of emotions here. He says, sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. And then he goes right from praising the Lord to saying, curse be the day where you know, I was born. <laughs> like, Jeremiah, you confused. Oh, no, you just hurt. You, know, you, you just hurt. You just hurt. You just don't know how you feel. Like, Lord, I just, just curse be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. He goes on to say, I, just whoever, even the person that, that came to tell my dad that he had a son. He said, curse be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, a man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not and let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noontide because he slew me not from the womb or that my mother might have been my grave and her womb to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days should be consumed with shame. And so you're just doing what God told Jeremiah. I'm just doing what God told me to do, but it's just not working out. And so he goes from there. Uh, well, from here we go to chapter 21. And in chapter one, he begins to make pronouncements on the kings or the leaders of Judah. And he starts out uh, talking about King Zedekiah. Now, for those of you that still have your uh, handout of the kings, if you, you know, and you don't have to refer there, I just want you to know that if you do have it, you can look there. If we're talking about Zedekiah, if you have it, you know that that is the last king. That, that is the last king. And so let's go over to uh, Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter, and we're going to leave Second Chronicles, and we're going to go over to Ezekiel, just to give you a backdrop of what's, what he's talking about here. L Lady Deborah, I may be just as confused as Jeremiah, but I don't necessarily think that he is confused when he praises God and then he takes that dim view of his existence because I don't know in a lot of ways I agree with that because I mean heartache and pain is coming your way you know both our parents both our mothers in their 80s and we can see the, the you know handwriting on the wall if we don't predecease them and just it's it's just existence, and no matter how good it get, you know that it's coming. Exactly. Well, confused was a poor choice of words. The facing reality is a better choice. Okay. Uh, and, and I certainly agree with you, and I think I, I came back and said that. Uh, yeah, confusion was just a, a, a okay. poor choice of words, but the reality of what his situation is fell on him, and that gave him the view, you know what, it's just a mix of emotions, just a mix of emotions. So here we have uh, uh, Jeremiah's pronouncement announcement against King Zedekiah. And as I said, King Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. And, and we know that, of course, those last kings is during this time that Jeremiah is prophesying, it was not a, uh, not a good one in the bunch. They were all evil. And so uh, he's talking to Zedekiah because uh, Zedekiah was a weak king. He wasn't a good king. He was a weak king. And then he had the nerve to try to buck up against Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so let's go over to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Let's look at Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter. And y'all, anytime you have something to say, just raise your hand or just hop in. 
it's the Lord's Academy, so uh, I don't want to be the only one talking all the time. So 2 Chronicles 36 and 13, and then we'll go over to Ezekiel. 2 Chronicles 36, 13. Well, I'll begin at verse 11. Second Chronicles 36, verse 11, Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So um, Zedekiah had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar by refusing to pay tribute. Let's go over to Ezekiel. Let's go over to Ezekiel. You know, when they, when they occupy virtually, they make you, you have to pay money to them to keep them from, you know, coming in to actually see, siege you. So, um, or set up a siege, Ezekiel, the 17th chapter. Let's look at verse 11. Are you there? Ezekiel 17, verse 11 says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon and hath taken of the king's seed and made a covenant with him and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be based, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping of his covenant, it might stand. So if you pay the money, you know, everything, everything will be okay. But he rebelled against him and sending his ambassadors into Egypt. So again, remember Judah, Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, they would always go to Egypt for their help because they thought that there was safety there. You have somebody or something or someone that you think that you can always depend on when you're going through something, you think if I call this person, I know they can help me. And have you ever done that and you found out they couldn't help you? Have you ever gotten your back up against a wall and you found out if the Lord don't help me, I can't stand the storm? You, there's a place you can get to where God wants you in a place, Pastor Bland, where you realize that he's the only one that can help you. And so God allowed them to keep going to Egypt. He allowed them to keep going to a weaker source, even though they thought it was a stronger source because they were so small and their military force was much smaller. God allowed them to keep going just so they could see it. Egypt can't help you either. You keep running over to Egypt. You keep running over to Egypt. I just need to show you that I'm the only one that can help you. That's what he was trying to get. As you said Wednesday, the only thing that this whole, whole Bible is about trusting God. Will you trust me? I think that they found out that, they, that the people that they was going to was just in the same shape they were in. The worst shape. <laughs> they in worse shape if they didn't know the Lord. And, that, and they know, the only way they could really get any help is by going. To, and, and, to the, and so, you know, they're going to Gentile the nations. Right. They didn't know God. Right. So they were actually in worse shape than they were. That's why, that's why it looks, you know, it was ludicrous, as, as little Jay might say. That, that it was ridiculous for them to keep going to them. You going to somebody that they're heathens. They don't even know the Lord. 
You know, it would make better sense if you had an ally that maybe, you know what I'm saying? But you're not, you're, you don't even, and so I, I certainly agree with you, Brother Davis. And so we're still in Ezekiel. He says, but he rebelled against him and sending him his ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that doeth such things or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? As I live, said the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he break, even with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons, seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when lo, he hath given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. So then, you know, making a vow, even then, if it was with um, Nebuchadnezzar says, you pay this tribute and then we won't, you know, rush in on you. That's that's a vow. Then you break that. You break that agreement that you had with Nebuchadnezzar. Then you then you get what's coming to you. You get what's coming to you. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't. You, 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 you just, you know, you, if you had been obedient, you wouldn't have been in this position to begin with. And so um, let's go back over to Jeremiah. And so Zedekiah, Zedekiah, you know, when we get our back up against a wall, when, when, when we have gone to the person or the thing that we thought could help us and we figure out that they can't help us, uh, Ski to what we end up doing in that end, we just go up, you know, we make the Lord the last resort. We make the Lord the last resort. And so now, you know, you calling for Jeremiah. Calling for Jeremiah for a word from the Lord. Well, you hadn't been looking for him. So now you, 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 you want to see what this, what should I do now? You know, you're scared. You, 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 you don't, you know, you're at your, you're at your wits in. And so now you, you're saying to Jeremiah, inquire, I pray thee in verse uh, two, chapter 21, verse two, inquire, I pray thee of the Lord for us. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, maketh war against us. If so be that the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works that he may go up from us. So how, how are you in, you break the oath covenant that you have with Nebuchadnezzar, but you want the Lord to do something about it. You did that on your own. Again, I go back to um, us, I go back to me. You do something, you put yourself in a situation your own doing. You know, I can't look around and blame anybody, Tiffany, but me for the situation that I'm in. I know it feels good to blame somebody else. And it feels good to say, I wouldn't be in this position if, I wouldn't be in this position if, but the fact of the matter is, I'm here because of my actions. I'm here because of my actions. And so, um, now what I want you to do is I want you to go and ask the Lord about it. And so he's desperate now. And you know, desperate times calls for desperate measures. He's desperate. He calls for Jeremiah. Uh, and uh, he hoped then that, you know, back in Hezekiah's day, God came and delivered them miraculously. And he hoped that something would come like that now. And so Instead of getting, though, a message of hope, uh, Jeremiah responded with dire, dire. is like, you know what, brother? Uh, you're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. And so then Jeremiah said in verse 3 unto Zedekiah, Thus shall you say to, then said Jeremiah unto them, Thus shall ye say to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of this city. And I myself, that's God talking, I myself will fight against you 
Now, Lord, you put yourself in a bad place, Zedekiah. So God is saying, not only will I, I'm not going to deliver you, not only am I not going to deliver you, but I'm going to join them in fighting against you because of your disobedience, because of what you've done, because of what you've done. And I will, I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. Lady Deborah, you think that if I, you could characterize this like this, that God is asserting to Israel his right to be that parent, that you have gone, you have done exactly what I told you not to do, and that is you've trusted someone else beside me. You've, gotten, you've set up idols. As a result of that, to correct you, I'm going to take you out of the land for 70 years. Now, my, my anger is not going to last forever. I'm going to bring you back after 70 years. But you're going to have to take this whooping. He whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. And they don't want to take a whooping. They've enjoyed um, the ascension. They've enjoyed being the top dog when Solomon was there. They were, they were, they were it. And we, we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> when you get off into yourself, that'll happen. You know, so they, they enjoyed all this, this uh, pleasure and luxury, all of what they accumulated, and now they don't want to turn it. They don't want to, they think and stand on their own. So they want to take a whooping? They don't want to take a whooping. And want to take a look. And I go back to the scripture in Hebrew where it says, He whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. You got to say you gotta take correction. So so now well, you know, we can look at it in the natural, brother Alex. You know what your parents told you. Well, brother, if you can't take no whooping, uh, yeah, you, you gotta get out of this go. house. Yeah. You gotta get out of this house. <laughs> you too grown for a whooping. It can't it? too too many grown folks in the house. Somebody got to go. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm no I we were told that many times. Uh-uh. So you know you have to humble on God. And now he's giving you an opportunity to humble on down. Right. Give you an opportunity to humble on down. I, all, all right, then. I'll take it. <laughs> all right. I won't do it no more. But you know, you know, you know, you know you will. And then that, the message of the false prophets were, this ain't none of God. You ain't got to go. Yes. You yes. got to go. You stay right here in Jerusalem. Yes. Then when they got over there, they went to crying. <laughs> so we, we hung our hops in the willows. How can we sing out, you know, wow. that from the strange they, land? They did that. They did that. They did that. So, so in verse seven, in verse seven, he says, "And afterwards said the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, and such as are left in this city from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those that seek their life. And he shall smite them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them, neither have pity nor have mercy. And look." And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life or the way of death. So God is giving them an opportunity. Jeremiah is saying, Okay, so there's, there's no hope. There's no hope for the king. But now I'm giving you, I'm offering you some hope. Let's go over to Jeremiah, the 38th chapter. Let's look at Jeremiah, the 38th chapter. Jeremiah 38, and let's go to verse 17. 38, 17. It says, are you there? Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus said the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live. Is that okay? I'm saying before you a way of life or a way of death. Okay? Then thy soul shall live, and this city 
shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hands of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thou so shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, thy friends have set thee on and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire and they are turned away back. So they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hands, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. So God set before them two ways. Again, the way of life, the way of death. He says, just go, because it's been, that was the judgment against you for your disobedience is that you're going to have to go. Lady Debra, it sounds like Zedekiah kind of believed Jeremiah, but he was afraid of the people because, you know, right there he says, you know, well, you know, if I do what you say, then the people, because, you know, the poll said that the people don't want to go <laughs> and they'll turn around, they like I'm putting you in stocks and putting you down there, they'll put me down there with you. I don't want to go down there with you. So I'm going to stick with what the people say instead of, I, I kind of believe that you're speaking for God, but I don't want to be in the shape. He had no backbone. There you go. He was, again, he was weak. He was weak. And, and the sad thing about it is, you know, Zedekiah, you read to the end of the story, he, it's, the last thing he saw, I think it was his two sons get killed. He said, this is the last thing I'm going to let you see. Then they took his eyes out. He didn't even see Babylon because they put his eyes out as they led him across the desert over there. And so um, it's, it's a good example. That's all I have. Thank you, Pastor Valan. I also think it's a lack of faith. Say what? I said I think that was a lack of, he was a, a lack of faith. He was putting his trust in his, and he put more trust in the people than he was God. He was thinking more about what they think about him instead of trusting on God, they know God was going to be at the end was going to bring him through it. Thank you. And I, I see that in people who belong to denominations. They think they, they need, because to me, this organization or this system tells you that they're going to take care of you. They're going to take care of you. They're going to make sure that your local church is taken care of. They're going to make sure you have the resources that you need. I mean, in theory, I know it doesn't really happen. But in theory, I, I think the reason that they won't, they call it having a covering. Uh, this umbrella that's over you, and if your church gets in trouble, these other people being in confederation with you, they will rush in and make sure that you stay afloat. But uh, I don't think that it really, really <laughs> happens a lot of times. But uh, I, what I'm getting out of this lady, Deborah, is the danger of trusting in anything or anybody but God. You know, and we even run into that trouble in our families. We get to trusting in each other and we find out that we, we all just human. So true, that is so true. So what do you think about this? Since, uh, let, let, let's talk about it. Well, I want you to turn to your neighbor. I wanna just, uh, I'm gonna read this and then I want you to turn to your neighbor and talk about this for just a moment. Since Nebuchadnezzar was doing the work of God in punishing the kingdom of Judah, and since God was allied with Babylon, as he said earlier, you know what? You, I, I'm going to turn your weapons of war against, back against you. And then I'm going to join with them. I'm fighting with them. Since God was a lie, allied with Babylon and fighting Judah, to surrender to Babylon really meant to surrender to the will of God. 
Does that make sense? Turn to your neighbor and talk about that for just a moment. To surrender to Babylon really meant to surrender to the will of God. What do you think about that? Turn to your neighbor and talk about it. to Brother Davis. I think he laid out choices for them to make. It was a choice for them to make whether they would go for, with Babylon. Like he said, you go with Babylon, you'll be with God. And I mean, is that the way it was worded? So I think that was a, he laid a choice out for them. And whether they, so if they went the, the, the way that he told them not to go, that was, the, that, was the, that, that was their own decision. And so if they didn't follow what he had told them, he had made it plain to them to say, you go with, go with, go with Babylon, you could be going with me, which is God. And they decided to go the other direction. So they ended up, if they went the other direction, they have to suffer the consequences. So uh, you, you said something there. You said they decided. That's what happens. They decided. Yeah. They operate in what we said was uh, you are leaning to your own understanding. Oh, understanding. You're leaning to your own understanding. So you think because, you know, you have false prophets saying don't go. So you're leaning to your own understanding saying that we can get out of what, what God has said. Pastor. That's funny. That's uh, that's exactly what we well, that's exactly what we were saying in our uh, in our uh, conversation is that uh, you know sometimes we think the will of God is a smooth way. Sometimes we think that there's no devastation, there's no nothing that's going to, but it's not always a smooth way. When you operate in the will of God, many times there will be hiccups. There's going to be some things that just don't look like it should be that way. And then you might look within your own senses, your own, your, your, you know, the carnal mind will say, well, I, 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 I know an easier way to do this. I know an easier way to do it. I don't have to suffer like this. I know an easier way or a better way. Sometimes we think we have a better way of doing something. <clears throat> Yes, yes, yes. And then the bottom line, and this is my last comment, the bottom line is this, is that God had ordained that to be so for them to go to Babylon. You know, as a consequence of your action, you'll go into captivity for 70 years. That was ordained. And since it was ordained, that means that was the will of God. That was the will of God. I know you don't want to go, but you got to go. And so if you just surrender to Babylon, then you're operating in my will. But even with that, Israel was, or Judah, they were stiff-necked and didn't want to do it. The, which one? Mother Helen? Okay, Mother Helen. Exactly, but you know what, they were so <laughs> caught up into the, the present 
They were so caught up in what was going on right then that they couldn't see the fact that God said, yeah, you're going, but you're coming back. You're coming back. They couldn't see that. They just wanted some immediate gratification. That get us in a lot of trouble, a lot of time, wanting to be gratified right now. Did you get to prolong that gratification? You'll go on and take your whooping like a man. Take your whooping like a man and then come on back home. Get a Lord of hand praise everybody.